communicate with many, many people throughout the county, and I'm always happy about that. What I work, I'm calling this kind of an introduction to restorative practices. It's called social connectedness during physical distancing. Um, because what we're seeing in the schools is that even though we've had to physically distance ourselves, we still have the responsibility to provide an avenue for social connectedness because people really are hungry for that connectedness. So um, I wanted to show you uh, this agreement. Actually, this is what we came up with actually today in a training that I uh, did this afternoon. And this is what the educators came up with when I asked them, what would be some community agreements that you would like to suggest that we follow? And they came up with confidentiality, take care of your own needs, avoid judgment, agree to treat others with presence and respect, focus on listening to each other, openness to questions, respect the speaker, listen to listen, not to respond, respect others' opinions, ask for, offer clarification when needed, listen first, then respond, be kind and open to different ideas and opinions. So I, the re, I'm just showing you this as an example that we encourage the schools to do this really in every classroom. We, we ask that people, um, that, that they will actually get the ideas from the students. So your students, we ask them to, um, to start by um, asking them, what, what, what helps you to feel safe in conversations? What helps you to feel safer, to be able to be more engaged in dialogue and things? So um, we actually, um, from the very beginning of doing this work, we will always make sure that what we do is we honor and value the voice and the ideas of our young people. And we like to, we like to project it onto a screen. We like to put it on the wall to, to, to basically say to them, at this school, you are valuable. Your voice is honored. You're an important member of this community. Um, so we just want you to know that if ever they bring that up to you, it's really because we, we say we develop community agreements together as community. And one thing that we like to practice is uh, mindfulness. And so here you have like a real kind of, um, kind of a nice soothing uh, photo of somebody looking at the, looks like either the sunrise or the sunset. And what, what we say is that if we are going to be either effective restorative practitioners with each other, meaning staff with students or students to student, you know, students with parents, that we need to be very mindful of this because being a restorative practitioner means rather than just reacting to, to different uh, comments or behavior, what we do, and in, 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 in we like to stay mindful because when we are, are, are trying to be restorative with people, we try to respond rather than react. And we want to, we, we understand that the teaching is happening in every human interaction. That, and we want to teach what we want to teach. We don't want to teach what we don't want to teach because many times in schools, we have taught what we really was not our intention, especially when we utilized punishment as our primary uh, mode to, to try to change behavior. What we taught to students was fear us and we are in charge and you have to just do what we say, be quiet, you know, kind of either do what we say or, or fear the wrath of what our punishment. And that is not what we wanna teach in schools. We want to be able to hold people accountable, but we wanna support them at the same time. And we want to do it with respect and love. But to do that well, we need to practice what we call mindfulness, especially as, as any kind of educator that understands this knows that you have to develop this to, on a daily basis. And we encourage parents to do this, but we also uh, we want you to know that we practice this with your students. We want them to develop their mindfulness because we want them to be restorative with each other, meaning that they become uh, helpers, peer helpers, peer healers. They learn how to listen, to be non-judgmental. 
And so we're going to do just a quick mindfulness activity so we can kind of show you how we do these things. And we'll take about maybe 90 seconds at, at the most. So I'm going to just ask you wherever you are, just kind of get comfortable in your seat. And, um, and all I'm going to ask is that we all focus on our breathing. So just try to feel your breath as you inhale and exhale, just feel it. Uh, and maybe with the sense of gratitude that we're, it's obviously a sign of life. And if you look at this photo, you see that there's a symbiotic relationship, an interconnected relationship between the human being and plants and trees. What we breathe out, they breathe in. And what they breathe out, uh, when oxygen, we breathe in. And it's really something that we have an interdependent relationship. And we just want to kind of have gratitude for that. So as we breathe, we know that that the, the earth is really our mother it, we that we we uh, depend on 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 the earth right we have this relationship that that is connected and so we always want to treat the earth with uh, respect and gratitude so when we breathe in and out we just kind of try to relax ourselves and focus ourselves and remind ourselves who we are Right, as educators, as parents. And we just remember how, um, just how valuable these young people that we serve are, that they are just life, true life and, and beauty. And so as we're breathing, we just kind of breathe in something that we may need today. Like using our imagination, we breathe in something like peace or maybe you need energy or focus maybe you need healing just breathe that in with the oxygen molecules and let it fill your body and your mind and then breathe out what you don't want to carry meaning if you don't want to carry resentment you don't want to carry that sadness that anxiety that depression just release it out with your breath and then continue to breathe in the positive you want. Fill yourself with it. Empower yourself through the power of your mind. And then breathe out again what you don't want. And practice this whenever you want. Yet it doesn't have to be just with, with this. And then we ask students this. Set an intention for yourself today. And why ask you this? Set an intention for your time with us today. For example, my intention is to be here with a generous heart, right? To be caring and, and, and loving. But you, you, you choose your own intention for this time together. Because what we try to teach young people is this, you have the power to choose. And we honor that. You're the one that chooses how you're going to be here. So then we just kind of take a relaxing breath and kind of come back. And so, that's how we do it. And, and we just are trying to teach the skills to our young people because we want them to be able to focus themselves. Even at home, learn to calm themselves down. They don't have to depend on substances from the outside. They have the power within them. But these are skills that they need to practice and practice and practice to get better at it. So instead of yelling at their dad or their brother or whoever, they can maybe go into the room and breathe and then make better choices. So it's a real good social emotional skill set to have. Now, one of the things when we teach about restorative practices, we look at these photos and, and we see the penguins huddling together um, as part of their survival and, and how they thrive in a very difficult environment. And we see the redwoods who are actually intertwining their roots together. Um, and so we, these are symbolic of how we're, we're encouraging young people to come together in community rather than just be these independent, separate beings. We say we want to come and, 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 and really come together as community and to support each other to serve to each other and to be served by each other like these penguins are doing and then 
we also, um, when we look at the trees, we kind of go, these are majestic, powerful trees. If you've ever seen the redwoods, you would know that. And yet they reach out to each other. They instinctively reach out to each other because they support each other. They communicate, they nurture each other, and they heal each other. That's what these trees do. And they're, many of them have been around for hundreds of years. But we say we want to do that as human beings in our schools. We want to learn how, from nature, the power and the beauty of nature. And we know indigenous communities have always um, learned from nature. So when we look at restorative practices, we say this is indigenous based, meaning this. What, what we've learned about restorative practices comes from indigenous communities because they have always been communities that have honored each other, valued each other. They've depended on each other for their very survival. So we say, let's come together and, and learn from some of the wisdom of, of indigenous communities where we learn to honor community, to value each other, and to, to help each other grow in becoming responsible and accountable to each other. And where students actually start to own their own education, their own school. Um, and it's, it's just really important for them to, to learn these, um, these basic concepts. Um, and then, so one thing I wanted to ask is this, when, this is something we do in school sometimes every day we ask the students, how are you feeling today? And sometimes what we do is we give them a number. On this example, we're giving them a number of one through 10, like a one through 10 number line. And we say one would represent that you feel awful. 10 would be that you feel amazing. So what number would represent how you feel today? And then what we do is, you know, on a, in a virtual format, we would ask them um, to put it in the chat for us where they can put their number and they might even put a sentence down of why they feel that way. And so what I would like to do is I'm going to uh, just stop the share of just a minute here. And um, I'm going to ask each of us, if you feel comfortable to just put something in the chat that would say one through 10, how are you feeling today? And it's okay if you have a low number. What we want from you is authenticity, right? We want to see your, your real number of how you feel today. And you're welcome if you want then to put a sentence about why, you know, to explain that. So go ahead, if you would, just go ahead and, 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 and put a number and a sentence if you're comfortable doing that. And you could put something like this. So what I said is, I feel like an eight. I feel I'm anxious about the elections, but very happy to be here. So if, if I was one of the students, what happens is they begin, they, what they realize is, is student Anthony is going through some anxiety, right? You know, because he's anxious about something. And that will, will help them in their dealings with me. And Magda says, I feel like a five because I am anxious about tonight's elections. So what happens is that may be something that, that Magda, the student Magda and myself connect on. Or if, if Magda is my teacher, I might feel like, wow, she's anxious too about the elections, right? So we connect and this is called what we call humanizing. And then, um, Mel, Mel says eight, I have good health and my family. So Mel is focusing on that positive, the gratitude, right? He's looking for the, the good things in life that help him to be in a, in a positive attitude. And, and this is what we do. We, we, we do check-ins with students so that they, um, that they we, we're trying to say to students, we value everything about you. And that certainly includes how you're feeling today. And, um, and we want them to begin to 
check in with themselves, and then communicate with us as a school community so that we know how they're feeling and then we can, we can be empathetic, understanding, and compassionate with each other because that's the restorative community that we're trying to create. But we need people to begin to feel safe to do this. And so that's what we, this is exactly what we do. And Teresa says, I feel like eight, happy with my family. So I, we, we celebrate with Teresa and Mel, right? The positivity that they're, that they're um, focusing on. And so th this is really what we're trying to do in the development of what we call a restorative, caring community. And, and the schools in part of CVLCC, they do this on a daily basis. It's something that, that is very important to them. And it's a part of the well-being of our community. But I know now we're going to be actually looking at our own sort of um, taking care of ourselves, right, as a foundation to the health of our community. So I think, I know, Danita, were you going to, um, and I can. Um, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, hi, everyone. So my name is Yanita, as Magda already said, and I'm pretty much going to follow um, kind of what Anthony said. I would like to share my presentation. There you go. And, oh, sorry. And I'm going to start with um, a quote that um, I kind of came up with for this session, which is, life is a walk, but you decide to walk forward or backwards right? Because we all walk, but it's our decision, as Anthony was saying, to either walk forward or backwards. And sometimes we don't realize it. We don't notice it. And that's where self-care comes in, right? Because I start taking care of everyone else around me, but I forgot the main person, which is myself. And most of the time what happens in this type of situation, especially right now with the pandemic, everyone be so isolated, kids running around. We try to focus everything on them and we don't make them part of our lives. And to work as a team, to work as a family, family comes from the concept of working as a team. And what parents tend to do a lot of the times, it's to um, segregate kids, not to inform them, not to let them know what's going on which what that ends up causing, it's increasing the levels of anxiety and stress, not only for the kids, but for the parents itself. And there's a difference right now when we're talking about mindfulness and there's mindful or mindful, right? We can divide this work into two. Is in my mind full of a lot of things that I'm going through in my mind that I can't control and I'm making a lot of assumptions about what's coming up, what's coming up next. Or am I really being mindful, which is focusing in the present? And here's where the question comes. What is it mindfulness means? What does it really mean, right? And sometimes we confuse mindfulness with having a lot of thoughts in our heads. And a lot of people are going to say, but Dejanita, how can I get rid of those thoughts? Now, lesson number one, we have to stop making assumptions. Making assumptions is a big portion of what's caused a problem and what causes our stress and our anxiety levels to go up. Right now with the election, <laughs> I, have, um, I have a couple of different groups that I work with, um, e even counselors, right? And the assumptions are going out there, running around on people's head. This is what's gonna happen. And in reality, we don't know what's gonna happen. No one has the key of what's gonna happen. And something that I want to mention is this pandemic, this pandemic, it's actually teaching us since the beginning, right? It's telling us you can control it. You only can do what's best in the moment that you're in right now. That's it. But you can control the future because if you're in the future, you're going to be stressing now. You're going to be anxious. And if you're in the past, you're going to be, um, you're going to be suffering a lot because you're attached to something. So the only, the only option that we have right now and what this pandemic is teaching us and this election is teaching us is pretty much to be in the present. And that's where healing starts. Healing starts to be in present, present with our kids. We choose to have a family, right? So now we, we have the time to be with our family. 
now how we can work out to be a family again. What we need to understand as a society right now and as a community is that there is a change, there's a shift that happened, right? We used to be um, everyone with busy schedules, not having time to pretty much be with our kids, um, connect with kids, connect with your children. Now we have all that time. Now we have a massive time, <laughs> right? And that massive time can be also a chaos in our mindset, right? It's how do I do this now, right? I haven't, I haven't done this for such a long, long time that right now I'm doing it and I just forgot how to do it, right? But it's not that you're doing something wrong. It's just a new, a new way. It's a new challenge. But it's also the opportunity of learning a new method, learning to pretty much create a new society, to heal our society from within. And that's extremely important. So Anthony was talking about restorative practices, but this is how we start restorative practice too. It starts from within ourselves, it starts in that home. That's when it starts, right? And I know that a lot of you were asking about motivation. Like, what do I do when it comes to motivation with my kids, right? Motivation comes from the word moved, which means to take action. That's what it means. So if I don't move, I can take action, right? If I keep doing the same thing over and over and over, nothing is gonna change. There is a saying, and I'm sure a lot of you have heard it, that it says, if you change, everything around you change. Right? And we don't say that just because, we say it because we change the way we envision and we see things and we start changing everything around us. If we see right now that I, my kids are acting up, I don't know how to control it, and I focus on the problem, on the negative part, then I'm going to be getting a negative effect. But if I focus of, okay, let me see what's going on. Let me ask what's going on then I will get an answer and that answer would lead me to try something new with my kid. It's like if I take, um, if I, it's, it's like if I take a ride to work and a lot of you, I'm sure that before you used to do that, that you take a ride to work and everything was the same, right? Back and forth, back and forth. And it gets to a point that you were like, oh my God, I need to take a different type of direction because it was so annoying, right? You feel like you were going to the same thing. It's the same thing with kids. You've been doing the same approach for such a long, long time, but of course it's not working right now. So we need to switch the approach. We need to um, change it a little bit. Try new things, be creative with your kids. And that's something sometimes that we're missing, but we're missing because we're focusing on our kids and we're not focusing on ourselves. So taking self-care is start being created with myself. Taking action with myself. How do I feel? because that's gonna translate to my kids, easy as that. So this saying, I love it. It says, we teach what we know, but we transmit what we do. And it's so powerful because sometimes we think that by saying or we're talking with our kids saying words, don't be anxious, don't be stressed, but our kids look at us and we're so stressed out, we're so anxious, right? That how are we supposed to correlate to that? How are kids supposed to understand that concept? The concept that they will be understanding is that being relaxed means to be stressed as a behavior. As a word they understand, but as a behavior they don't because you guys are stressed, because you guys are anxious. So that's why it all starts within ourselves, right? And here is, I'm, I'm just putting some examples of pictures, but as you can see, we teach what we know, right? But we transmit what we do, and that can be either positives or even negatives. Because our kids are absorbing everything that we do all the time. And in order to change that vision, right, we need to change ourselves too. That's the first step. And a lot of the times we're asking like, how can I do this with my kid? Start it with you. Ask yourself, what would you do different? It's your kid. You're the expert on that child, <laughs> right? But sometimes we forgot that we're the experts. And that's how we start making that connection in our, and within our environment, right? What's meditation? A lot of people um, ask a lot about meditation. Like, I want my kid to meditate, but he can't focus. He'll start yelling, he'll start laughing, right? That happens a lot. 
But the problem is the concept that we have about meditation. Meditation is not only to be um, sitting down, closing our eyes, and breathing. Meditation means being doing something that you enjoy. That's meditation. Meditation means running, running a bike if you want to. Meditation means painting if you want to. And I'm talking about not the kids, I'm talking about parents. Meditation be, is, means doing something that you have, haven't done in such a long, long time and that you want to. That's your 30 minute or your one hour or your 20 minute for you is me time, right? So um, to start with that concept, I think we have to switch it a little bit. What meditation means for you? What's something that you could do that will take you away that stress? Maybe it's cooking, right? Maybe it's um, creating something. So maybe some of you have done things probably when you were back in college or when you were like, younger and you haven't done that in a long, long time and you wanna start crafting again. That's meditation. That's what meditation means. Sometimes we get so caught up in the concept that we forget what it really means. And Magda, I know there's some questions over there. I'm sorry, I can't really see what it says. So if you can help me out with that. Um, but I, I wanna make, make sure that we understand the concepts, first of all, which is mindfulness and meditation and what does it mean? And Anthony was doing a great practice, but something that I will add to that practice will be to touch your, or look for your pause. And I want every one of you, even though I'm not looking at you, look for your pause, look for your pause. If you find it, you're gonna feel like the thick from your heart, right? If you start breathing, just focusing on that, start questioning, who is there? How, how am I alive? Because this is an amazing moment. The fact that we're alive, it's an amazing moment. And we forget about that because we're trying to focus so much in the future. We're trying to focus so much in, in providing. We're trying to focus so much in how am I gonna do this? How am I gonna do that? But we first will have to focus on our health. Be present. And a good way to take a, um, a conscious breathing, it's a conscious breathing, that's the way I call it, is to pretty much look up for your pause, take a couple deep breaths, but just focus on your pause. That's it. Just focus on the pause. And believe me, when you focus on your pause, a lot of you will be able to focus on that. A lot of you, a lot of thoughts are gonna come in, but this is the starting point. This is the starting point because that's recognizing yourself. You're starting with recognizing yourself and that you're important too. And you're a good parent. Don't blame yourself so much. You are a good parent. You just forgot how to enjoy to be a kid. And I'm not talking about your kids. I'm talking about yourself, right? Sometimes we grow up so fast that we forgot like what we really enjoy as a parent. And we have to remember that that's what our kids look up to. They look up to us. Their heroes is probably us. So what kind of hero do you wanna be for them? Right? What kind of person, what is it that you wanna transfer to them? So if your kid, for example, um, and I, I think I read some questions, Magda, um, that you forwarded to me, and some, uh, people were asking me, how can I make my student, my kid to focus? How can I make my kid to be motivated? Ask yourself, are you motivated as a person, as an adult? Are you focused as an adult? What different type of approach do you wanna take? Are you exhausted as an adult? Are you tired as an adult? If right now schooling it's not fun for kids. We have to work and make it fun for them. And the best way is to be creative. So if your kid can be, if as soon as a kid listens to the computer, he just doesn't want to listen to it, let's try to make something fun around it, which is take him outside. Something that I do with my students, these are college students. With my college students, what I do is like, go ahead, take a break, go outside, 
go and touch the tree, bring me, bring me a rock, bring me a plant, whatever you want. I just I wanna, I want, I wanna know that you actually went outside, took a couple of deep breaths, and that's it. Right? We have to be creative as a parents and as the teachers. We have to go back into finding purpose to our lives. And that's not only for teachers, that's for everyone. We have because we have lost focus in our purpose. And our purpose is not just to make money. Our purpose is to live, enjoy life. That's our purpose. So how do we balance both? That's the question really that you have to ask yourself. That's the key right here. How do we do that? And that starts with being creative with ourselves. So a way to be creative with your kids kids will be to start to be creative with yourself. Try something that you haven't done in a long, long time. That's going to be your homework for all everyone that is here. <laughs> and I don't want to give you homework, of course, but that's the first step. And you'll see the difference. Once you try something new for yourself, you're going to start being more creative with your kids. Because when you're in tune with yourself, you'll know what to do with your kids. And of course, people like Anthony and myself will be there to guide you into it as well. Of course, that's what we're here for. But the expert who needs to do the work, guess what? It's you. That's it. It's you. You are the one who needs to connect with yourself. And this is the perfect time to do so. So how do we transform, right? How do we transform um, something that, that, um, a victim role, and I don't want to call it victim because I know it's a very strong word, a victim role into a creator role. How do we do that? It's very easy. We have to stop slacking ourselves and we have to do our work. So if I have to pretty much be creative with myself and take time to myself to pretty much hold my kids, guess what? That's what I'm going to do. And this is so much needed right now. And for those of you who are concerned with COVID right now, which I know you are, of course, and hearing the news, listening that the numbers are increasing, that Europe got locked down again, and all this that is happening, we have to understand that um, the news are one thing. And in this moment, people are living different type of realities. So if it's becoming too much for you, turn off the radio, turn off the social media. Take a walk outside, nothing is going to happen. Believe me, research has shown that people with high uh, vitamin D, which is sunlight, are people who have gone the virus, but it has been less aggressive with them. It's not a coincidence that even our nature is telling us, even our body is telling us, go outside a little bit. It doesn't mean that you have to go and mingle with everyone else. No, maybe in your backyard. Maybe you create a spot in, in, in that area. Maybe you want to take your kids for the break right there. Maybe you want your kid to take the class outside. Maybe you have that space for your kid to take the class outside. Take it outside, right? And believe me, it, 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 will, it will come back and people will start enjoying it more. The, the issue right now is that we don't know how to transform that. We don't know how to switch it. Because this is very unknown for a lot of us. So the key is to see the learning behind the lesson. That's the key. And if we're not able to see the learning behind the lesson, then we're going to be suffering. And we're, we're going to become victims. And it's, we're going to start walking backwards. And if we start walk back in, walking backwards, then I'm going to fall and it's going to hurt. So if I want to walk forward, then I'm going to take the challenge and I'm going to start creating a new environment for myself because I know that it will pretty much affect my kids. So thank you. I hope this was helpful for a lot of you. Um, uh, Magda, I don't know if there's some questions. I know that you wanted to give some time for questions out there. You addressed uh, a few of them wonderfully. Um, there's one that I think would be uh, perfect for Anthony to address. It says, 
How can I begin to forgive my spouse for the yelling and the disrespect that this pandemic has caused in our family? Wow, that is a, whew, that's a big one right there, right? So how can I begin to forgive myself? Um, and I think, you know, if we want to be more forgiving with others, just like um, the Anita was, has talked about, the health of our family begins with us. The same thing, if I want to be more forgiving, I need to be willing to forgive myself first. And then as I, as I experience the freedom of that, I'm more generous with that uh, forgiveness with others. But I, I know that that's easy for me to say and difficult for people who have, have for, you know, for many of us, we've grown up in environments where um, a lot of guilt has been put on us from either a church or a parent or society. And, um, and we carry this uh, kind of heavy burden of guilt. And, um, and so when we see things going wrong and we get, um, we get frustrated with it, we begin to react. And that's part of the reason why we said we need to have this kind of um, uh, mindfulness practice. And I really like how um, Danita was t talking about mindfulness can be just a walk in the park, uh, riding your bike, uh, you know, walking on the beach. It, and I would even say, I know one of your, um, one of the parents was asking that about her, uh, her mindfulness with her child and her child doesn't, you know, gets distracted very quickly, but I'm like, go for a walk with her and, and, and have her admire the trees. I really like what Danita said is like, Hey, go, go, go pick a leaf and bring it back and let's look at it or let go get a rock and let's collect a few rocks together. Something beautiful that they can do together. Um, in that creativity, the way Danita was teaching us, I think is extremely powerful for people. And then that gives life to us. And then we will probably be yelling less. We will be more forgiving. Yeah. Um, another one uh, in the chat right now, it says, uh, what could we say to parents who are stressed um, and guilt? They feel guilt because their, their children are home but they have to work and they can't pay attention to their children uh, because they're working. I, I think, um, and, and this, this part is very important when we talk about time, I don't have time to pay attention to my kids. Time, it's not how much time do you spend with your kids. It's the quality of time that you spend with your kids. If you spend 15 minutes, the quality of time with your kids, just checking in with them, just, playing maybe younger or a, a game with them just to know that you're there, that even though you're not there as all the time, you're there in some form. That's, that's enough. You, you know, and, and we always say this, quality over quantity, it always going to be the best, right? Because there's a lot of, and I don't want to say a lot of parents, but there's parents who are quality time all the time there, but they're not really with the student, with the kids, right? Sometimes they spend a lot of time on their phones or on their own things. So that's not quality of time. So it doesn't matter how much time do you have. It's like the quality of time that you're gonna be investing in your kid. So if it's 20 minutes, how those, put your mindset, right? Put that intention into yourself and say, this 20 minutes are fully for my kids and that's it. And with that, believe me, kids will feel that, will sense that because you are connected to each other. That's, that's what we are. We all are connected to each other. That's how we teach each other too, right? So it's, remember always quality over quantity, always. That's a really good point. And I, I just wanted to add um, to that, like when, when Danita says that quality, one of the things that I think all of us have experienced the quality that she's talking about when you're with a loved one and they pay attention to you and they ask you questions about you and they don't judge you they just celebrate you for who you are um, i think if we can do that with our with our young people they feel it they feel that we truly are um, curious and want to learn about them and that we accept them right where they are even even if they're expressing some anxieties or things that they're going through. And we just say, you know, I hear you. Let, you know, help me to know what's the best way to support you through this. That kind of quality connection is the connection we're talking about. 
Um, a lot of parents want to know um, how to help their children with coping with stress that they feel with the overwhelming amount of work. Um, CVLCC prides itself with rigor, uh, but right now with everything going on, their children, they're feeling stress. And so they want to, how can we help our children cope with that stress? Well, as Anthony was saying, restorative practices are extremely important, right? And it starts with a communication, right? Mm -hmm. It starts with communicating with the school, right? And, and as a parent, as a group of parents saying, this is a lot. And it is true. Even for us who work from home, working from home online, it actually adds up a lot of time that we didn't, that we didn't have before. So that's why it's more, it's, it's very time consuming. So I think it all starts with that conversation, with that, with that communication with, you know, the main people in the school um, to see how can we work together, right, in the classroom to maybe decrease it, not, it, that it's not about homework. And that's another thing too. Education, we're making a shift. But you have to understand as a parent that as educators, we're going through that transition as well, right? And the shift is gonna be that it's have to be more practical. Mm -hmm. Less homework and more practical, right? Less outside and more inside. That's where it starts. So we're starting that conversation and I'm glad that parents are bringing that up because that conversation, it, it's coming up in this school, but it's coming up across, you know, across the county, across the world, I think. So we are doing that, but we have to start addressing those type of concerns with you know the proper channels in this in this case yeah, and i also think that that goes right back to what danita was teaching us about quality is more important than quantity so you can give so much homework that people ultimately start to feel burned out they feel like it's a burden that's not what education should be it should be like she was talking about earlier it should be fun. It should be engaging. It should be practical. It should be truly about life and connecting with what's their interest. And then, so I, I like the fact that if the parents come together and the school, the, the, the staff there already are trained in restorative practices, they will, they will value the voice of the parents. And then they will be pushed to communicate with each other so that they're not overwhelming families, but they're supporting them. And Anthony, can you speak a little bit about, uh, because as a school system, we've had some pushback from parents. Well, you, this child hurt my child, so you need to suspend this child. Um, and we do get some pushback, even though we have had several trainings. What, um, what do you see as a value of restorative practices in, in, when, in those kind of scenarios? Sure, uh, thank you. And so, uh, you know, by the way, um, people harm people all the time. Um, even our families, um, harm is happening pretty much daily through comments, through sometimes physical, but most of the time through emotional, through verbal type things. So the same thing happens in school. But by the way, when that harm happens in our home, we don't just kick out our children. We don't say, go find a place to live for a day. You know, um, we, we work with them and we teach them. So that's the, the concept of the school is that it's kind of like a sort of like a, like a second family for a lot of children. And what we say is when people harm each other, we take it as a teachable moment. Like it's an opportunity for us to teach young people how your words and how your behavior actually impacted another human being. Because we're about teaching understanding, empathy, and compassion. And, and that will ultimately build their social emotional skills and they will actually take that home and be able to have better relationships at home and honestly better relationships as they further on in life and um i'm gonna add something personal because i know that sometimes when you add something personal you connect more it makes more sense but when i was young when i was in middle school i used to be bullied all the time but then later on I became the bully, mm. right? So I played both roles in a way. One was pretty much, I was allowing people to bully me because I didn't know how to defend myself. And then on the other side, I was like, okay, okay this is the only way that I have to defend myself. So I'm gonna do the same thing, right? So sometimes kids, what 
what we do, and I'm going back into my, my, my times, right? What we tend to do is a defense, a self-defense mechanism. And we have to understand where is that kid is coming from, right? Because it's not only in school, sometimes it's at home. So a, a practice that I do with uh, parents a lot, because it starts with the parents, right? Is what is this situation teaching you? I'm always about learning something about the situation. What is this situation teaching you and how you're gonna approach that? So a, a, a good practice before I approach the situation is, and the Mayans have this saying, it's not mine, which I, I love, but they said, I first see you, then I see me, I see myself, and I see how am I seeing you. Because I learn more from looking to myself than judging and looking at the other person. And that will help me out to understand what is this situation teaching me and how can I act on it in a better way. In a way that I can heal myself, my kid, and the other person as well. Because a lot of times we bully people, but that's because it's pain. There's a lot of pain in, in us. Mm -hmm. That's the reason why we're trying to hurt another person, we're trying to hurt someone so that person can feel the same thing that I'm feeling. Yeah. It's not justified, of course, but we have to understand where what, each one is coming from. And restorative practices is great when it comes to this because it's helping out to confront those situations confront the pain and learn from the person who is acting up and the person who is not putting boundaries. That's a good way of stating it. Um, when you said to ask the school for help when your, um, your son or daughter is having a problem, a parent wrote, I did ask the school for help with my daughter, but I didn't get any answers. What could, what could that parent do to help um, their daughter? Well, first of all, I would say this, I would say, um, as somebody that works with, in schools and say, I, I apologize if that is the, how it came across. I know that C CVLCC tries their best. So I know that that's probably wasn't the intention to give you that, that feeling that we don't care about you or your daughter. So, so first of all, our apologies as educators and that we will improve this. So just for you, Sandra, that we say right now we commit to working with you to help your daughter. We don't know if we have all the answers, but we will say this committed to you. We will work with you and, um, and we will definitely honor you, you by, by letting you know that we're here for you, even if it's just listening and then trying to work together to make things better for your daughter. Um, I think that's always the best place to start to acknowledge it and then to move forward to, um, together. Now, if for whatever reason you then don't still don't get any kind of response, people, don't, I think you what you do is you you try to go um, higher up in the kind of like you know in the hierarchy, and you you ask you know I ask for this help and I need help, and if that that then go higher. Um, you know, you, you, there's there's usually that kind of protocols within school systems that if you don't get the help you need, you have the right to go and make kind of like a complaint as you're advocating for your daughter. Another um, staff member said, can, can we please have the presenters talk about stress and how stressed parenting, um, what that does to their children? Well, it's pretty much the same thing. <laughs> so the same feelings that you experience as a parent, it's the same feelings that your kids are experiencing. Right. So if you're feeling stressed and anxious, that's the same thing that kids are experiencing as well. So that's why I said at, uh, at the beginning when we start talking, it all starts within ourselves. Because if I don't, if I'm not able to convey to the kid, what does it mean to be relaxed? What does it mean to be calm? Then, of course, the kid won't be able to correlate that. And I said that because I have parents sometimes that tell me, I don't know why my kid is so anxious. I don't know why my kid is always biting their nails. But you see the parent and the parent is biting the nails. It's always anxious, right? It's like, that's, I always tell them that to be calm, to be relaxed. But the parent is always like, you know, acting up as well. It's like, you can't tell your kid to be relaxed when you're not, because that's what he sees. That's why I said, we learn, um, 
we teach what we know, right? Which is what we said to our kids. But really what we do, they learn our behaviors. So if my behavior translate into that's relaxed means biting my nails and all, that's pretty much what the kid is gonna do, right? So that's why we have to change that approach and look at ourselves. That's why we have to take that time to, in that moment to look within ourselves. And most of the parents, Probably sometimes they, they tend to say, no, but the kid is the first one. The kid is the first one. And to be honest, it's not. It's been find out that the first person, it's you. And if you're not okay, nothing around you, including your kids, are going to be okay. Yeah. And Danita, I wanted to go back then to what you, you really laid the foundation for us of the importance of self-care is a real responsibility for parents. It's not just like, oh, this sounds nice. It's all kind of sounds like a hippie. No, this is like super important because what she's saying to us is this. If you truly invest in yourself, you will be a much better parent. And if you don't invest in yourself, you will be depleted. You will allow anxiety to overcome you. And that may mean this. That, that may mean you have to wake up a little bit earlier or whatever it be so that you can make sure that you have time for yourself. I mean, real time for yourself to do something that is good for you. And I, I, I'm, I'm going to be truthful. I do it every single day. It's like, it's a sacred time for me. And it's, it's done just with me. And I do what I wanted. I go for a walk. I do a little bit of jogging. I, I listen to certain music I like. I pray. I read. And it's a significant amount of time in the morning. Now, you know, some people might say, well, it kind of seems like a lot of time to spend. But to me, I listen to what Danita's talking about. And I know it to be true because I live this. I have seen the fruits of what she's talking about. And I've raised two children. So I know that um, when I when I haven't taken care of myself, I've been more anxious and reactive to their behavior. And when I've done the, the self-care, honestly, I have responded and I've been a teacher the way I I've taught what I really want to teach. Thank you. Um, I think during these times, and I think they, Anita and both of you have said that um, this pandemic has taught us, has taught us a lot of things. Um, one of the things, Anthony, that I, when I went to your workshop, what I appreciated is the fact that you got us in a circle. And if you can talk about the power of that circle and that coming from the Native American uh, um, traditions of also sharing our personal stories, our family stories, um, those beautiful oral storytelling um, uh, traditions that I shared with my dad and my mom, grandparents, um, so I think talk a little bit about that and how that can help us during these times. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. So really the circle is, um, and, and usually we're sitting or standing in circles, is a, is a basic format that we typically like to do when we're face to face. And really it's kind of like a representation of community where everybody can see everybody. So you're not in the Western kind of rows and, you know, people, you can't see them because they're in back of another student. So um, it really helps to um, kind of, uh, I guess, build the community just by the form that it's taking. And then if you notice, there's no beginning and there's no end. It's kind of a very powerful, um, almost like energy, I guess you could call that. And, and believe it or not, if you look at not only the Native Americans, but every single person that's present on this, on this Zoom call here. If you look at your ancestry, I, I can guarantee you at one point or another, people sat around a campfire, like around a fire, and they, they you know what they, where the first school was? Was right there. That's where they told stories, and they, they, they began to build their history, and they told their stories and they shared information. And somebody, like if I was sitting there with Magda and Magda begins to tell me, hey, you know, I was able, I was collecting these berries over at this place and I noticed, wow, there's also, there were like these, th there's an apple tree over there and there's this and, and we learned from her. And we begin to go, oh, wow, that's a good place. And then as I'm listening to Danita, you know, she says, you know, but also I was over in this place and there was really good fishing there. And, but I did notice there was a, 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 a like two, 
two bear cubs and I saw the mother and I got away quickly. So even though I know that might be a good fishing spot, she is helping to protect me because I don't want to become, in, I don't want to go in between a mother and her cubs. So this is where we were learning. And, and it's, it's honestly, it's a part of our DNA, whether we believe it or not, it's in us and it's part of our ancestors and it's the way our ancestors shared wisdom. And it's also the way we built relationships, right? And we, we began to trust each other. Um, and our stories are, are, is part of our history and our stories are part of ourselves. It's a way that we are vulnerable with each other. Even if we're telling each other, hey, I was, I was really afraid over there. I didn't know what to do. And, um, and, and it's like somebody saying, I'm willing to show you exactly who I am and then if the, re if the response is one of care and love, it makes me feel even safer. It makes me feel like I can be my authentic 100% self in this, in this circle. And I'm going to add that a little bit to that, Anthony. Does anyone here know uh, where a table it's coming from? Why do we, why do, why our ancestor develop a table? Was it only to eat or was it to sit down in circles and talk to each other? Mm. Our, the table, right? When we have our sacred um, food, right? That's where it's coming from too. It's coming from that circle of having something sacred, having some time to ourselves and to pretty much talk to each other about what's going on in the table. Our tribes used to do that, of course, in fire, but now, right, we evolve into a table so we can have our food and at the same time share what's going on. And if we look, if we go back into our history, into our mother, parents, where you always have those conversations, it's in a table. So. That is a perfect end to our evening. I want to thank um, both of you. And like I put in the chat, all of us, all of us really for taking the time to be present. Um, we realize that if we don't take care of self and I'm listening to everything and taking it in stride because I know I need to do the same thing, take care of ourselves so that we can take of our families, take care of our loved ones and our coworkers. Um, so I want to thank you. And hopefully this will be the start to a series um, so that we can learn to take care of ourselves. So thank you, everyone, and have a very good evening. Muchas gracias. Fernanda, gracias. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Take care.